Painting loose has consistently eluded me. It's one of the aspects of my art that I really wish I could work on the most, but it has been one of the hardest to master. Today on this episode of Master Studies, we're going to be working on a Konstantin Korovin study. Konstantin Korovin was a leading Russian Impressionist painter. I had never really heard of him before I did a deep dive on wikiart.com and encountered his work, and I'm so glad that I did. I really love his stuff, but I feel like he's maybe not that well known, and I feel like his work deserves more recognition, so we're going to be talking about him today. Traditional Russian academic painting definitely has a far more realist vibe. If you've ever taken a Russian academic drawing class, you'll know that it's very academically rigorous and very much in the realist kind of tradition. Konstantin Korovin at the time was kind of uninterested in this. He wanted to think of painting as poetry and not journalism. He wanted to really push the boundaries of the style at the time, and he he really found a great community of artists in the Impressionists in Paris. I think it's important to remember that at the time that these artists were working, Impressionism was actually a very controversial art movement. It was thought of as scandalous, gauche, tasteless. The salon, the kind of traditional art world, did not like the Impressionists or the art that they were making. But Korovin found this amazing community of Impressionists in Paris when he visited and really fell in love with this style. It had an enormous impact on the visual language that he uses in his work. Paris would influence Korovin so much, in fact, that he returned to it time and time again throughout his life to visit, work, and paint. Korovin was actually eventually buried in Paris, and he just, he loved that city so much and found so many amazing friends there. Korovin's work has a very dreamy, subdued quality to it. It's kind of similar to the tonalist paintings that I'm working on also on this channel. There's still like this loose brushwork that's very typical of the Impressionist style, but Korovin's not as liberal with the bright and high chroma colors as someone like Monet or Van Gogh even were. Very much subdued. You can definitely see the Russian academic style influence here in the subdued colors, the very kind of almost morose, a little bit depressing in the color palettes. Kind of like you're walking around on an overcast day and everything is foggy and dark but there's still hope there. That's kind of how I view Korovin's work. He painted a bunch of landscapes. They're all amazing. I love them all so much. It's very impressionist, but there's something else there too. And I think that's kind of the precursor to tonalism, which was a little bit later, and definitely the influence of his Russian, his Russian history. Unfortunately, despite all of the success early on in Korovin's career, he died mostly penniless due to almost all of his paintings being stolen on the eve of a massive exhibition of his work in 1923. His son, Alexei Korovin, was a Russian-French painter, but I'm not sure if Alexei had any children and kind of what became of their family. Constantine's work, though, was so beautiful, and I hope that we can continue his legacy by admiring his artwork and just learning something from his techniques. The characteristics of Korovin's work really, really drew me in, really enchanted me. There's a lot to be learned here when it comes to rendering versus articulating, how to hint at something without spending a lot of time detailing it, especially when it comes to this particular piece. I had a really hard time figuring out how to emulate Korovin's style here. There's a lot of brushwork, some reflections in the water, the trees had so much character, but he articulates, he doesn't render. And that was very difficult for me to emulate. It involved a lot of like looking at the precise location of his brush strokes, etc., that I found really challenging, like just insanely challenging, but immensely informative. The process behind this piece was honestly quite taxing, quite complex, a little bit exhausting if I'm being honest. And I ended up having to take a pass at this study about three times before I finally was satisfied with the finished version. Versions one and two to, I tried to study the painting, the original, entirely. Just take the composition, scale it down a little bit, put it on a surface of the same ratio, and just see what happens. I wanted to study the entire painting rather than just a selection of it, and this was really, I think, a bad decision on my part. I was not paying attention to the scale of the original painting. I wasn't thinking of brushwork and 
like the literal physical sizes of my brushes and how much I was able to cram into one space. This resulted in just a really tough time once I got past the sketch phase. Blocking in the composition was fine, but the really hard part that just consistently eluded me throughout this process was the finer points of the brushwork. Really cramming everything into way too small of a space was, of course, a very punishing kind of challenge. In particular, I kept being very frustrated when I hit the trees in the background. The trees were probably my favorite part of the original painting, but the hardest part for me to get right in both version one and two. I just really had a very hard time getting the shape of these trees right, the character, the kind of droopy nature and how they have this very lovely contrast against this kind of light overcast sky. And I was just really disappointed in myself that I wasn't able to get it right in these first two versions. So after beating myself up a ton, I ended up trying version three. Version three of this study was very different from versions one and two. For version three, I did what I always try to do when a composition is giving me a hard time. I switch up the ratios and either zoom in or zoom out. In this case, I switch Switch to a much smaller surface with a portrait or the landscape orientation and zoomed in on the original a lot. I really wanted to focus on those trees and so I did. This third version of this study is just focusing on these trees and I really liked the end result so much more. As you can see here, I start in with toning the canvas with Capucine Red Light. This is a Vasari oil paint color probably one of my favorite brands, if I'm being honest. Capucine Red Light is like a very subdued red, kind of brownish, if I'm being honest, like kind of a muddy vermilion. I tone the canvas with that, and then I go ahead and block in just like the very rough basic shape of these trees, like this kind of diamondy sort of shape. Get that out of the way, establish where my trunks are, and then I go in with figuring out the masses and the placement of these branches and kind of the the shape of these trees. I really, like I said, struggled in version one and two getting the character of these trees down correctly and really capturing their essence. And I wanted to pay particular attention to that same weakness in version three to really nail these trees as much as I possibly could. I still had some trouble just getting all of the branches in the right places, the right shape of them, but I feel like I had a much better grasp on it in this version. So I established those masses and really do all of that work trying to figure out where the dark parts are in this painting, all the dark points, the midpoints, and then for the highlights, I actually use a thinned out white to reestablish those highlights, particularly in the sky and kind of the bottom of like this brush that's happening on the bottom of the canvas. This helped just a ton in giving me a better idea of the structure of this painting. Establishing those highlights and just figuring out where all the masses of this shadow space are was just so immensely helpful. I felt like I finally had a better handle on the underlying structure of this composition and that made such a massive difference. From there, I kind of very gradually, almost hesitantly added in color. In versions one and two, when I had that sketch down and then started to add color, I felt like that was when things started to go wrong. So I tried to really add in color slowly and analytically to do it right. So I didn't have to do version four because if I had to do a fourth version of this piece, I would have just not made this video to be honest with you. It would have just not happened. So we did version three, just doing that sketch, slowly adding in color, very gradually being very mindful of the original, the character of these trees, trying to get it right this time and paying a lot of attention to the slight differences of these greens. Like I said before, Konstantin Korovin, he wasn't really a big fan of a lot of high chroma color in his paintings. There's a lot of just very subtle differences in these greens and these browns that really make a difference. So for the colors here, my palette really relied on a lot of my Vasari Tonalist paints. Vasari has this Tonalist set of colors that I love. French Anthracite Gray is a very kind of subdued, low contrast shadow color. It's not quite as dark as a black, but it does have quite a bit of like a purpley Payne's Gray kind of character. And then for the trees, I relied a lot on olive green, jasper, and cedar all by Vasari. 
sorry to really nail those colors. But for all of the lighter, paler greens of all of this underbrush, I added in a little bit of radiant yellow and some shiprock. Radiant yellow is by Gamblin, shiprock by Vasari in the mixing stage to kind of nail those colors and get them just right. Radiant yellow is just a very high chroma, which lemon yellow, like the most lemon of yellows that you will ever possibly find, but it makes a huge difference. It has an immense opacity. It has just a ton of punch when you're color mixing and it really brought those greens to life and made them really special. But for the shadow colors, I wanted things to be a little more interesting. I find that whenever you use just straight black for your shadows, you really take a lot of character out of your paintings and I wanted to have my shadows be very colorful and have a little more character. So for those, like I said, I used French anthracite gray, lovely color, love that so much. And I also used shale. Shale is this very interesting color by Vasari. It's almost like a very desaturated, like brown purple. I love it so, so much. Coupled with French raw sienna light genuine, which is kind of a desaturated brown green, I was able to really bring these trees and Corovin's vision in this study to life. I was able to really capture that feeling of like this almost magical forest caught at either this very like strange overcast, foggy, smoky kind of time of day. I'm from Minnesota, so the sky here in all of its greens and like pale pinks reminded me a little bit of like when there's a massive tornado warning and you go out in the sky, it's just like this very strange color. It looked a little bit like that, but yeah, I just took my time with this one. I found that I really had to be very analytical throughout this process and just really look back at the original painting and then my version and then back at the original time and time again to really nail those shapes. The interesting collection of shapes in this composition in the original, I think really make this painting. This painting is not very rendered. The low underbrush are just like swipes of color. They're just random loose brushwork, but they all come together because of this interesting collection of shapes that Kurovin managed to, to harmonize together. I think that's really special. Like all of these trees look so interesting and they look so interesting just because of these really cool shapes. I love these shapes. These shapes are great. 10 out of 10 when it comes to shapes. And yeah, I think when it comes to the takeaway of this painting, what I would suggest that you learn from this experience that I just had was when you are struggling with a composition, zoom in, zoom out, just change the ratio of whatever surface that you're working on and really just completely rethink it. I was having a really hard time getting these trees right, painting as small as I was. And so I think zooming in really helped me. It allowed me to just focus completely on this particular part of this painting, these subjects in particular, and that made the difference. That brought me to the finish line. So when you are doing a master study, be very mindful of the size of the brush strokes on the original, just the original size of it, period. When you are doing a smaller study, just be mindful of your ability to pack things into a small space because it is just infinitely more challenging. And yeah, that is, that is what I learned. I hope you enjoyed this video. I had a blast with this process. Like I said, it was a challenge for sure, but I really love how it came out in the end. So that is it for me and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.